A lot's happened since yesterday! Shut! <laughs> That's right. You're gonna chase ch greasy chickens for the rest of your life. That's right. You're, well, bomb, that? you're gonna you're gonna crap lightning and you're gonna shit thunder. I don't know what it was, something like that. <laughs> Is it, yeah. You're gonna eat lightning was, and you're gonna crap thunder. Crap yeah. thunder. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. We have an aficionado. We have another Rocky. Oh hell fan yeah, dude. I grew game. up on Rocky. Are you kidding me? Rocky. Love it, man. And uh the Terminator and Predator. Those like Great. Like, come on. Yep. But great movies. Great movies. Th this is why we're all such well balanced adults. Yes, this is why our outlook yes. of uh, our outlook is so positive, and you know, hey, honestly though, we grew I up would, with. I would fucking argue though with yeah those movies. We kind of do though, mm. because how many times does something happen, and one of us have the kick of, no, it's not how hard you get hit. But you keep moving forward. We kick into that Rocky mentality, and Mick gets guts. That's in. actually get up, you honestly, son of a bitch! And you're like, I gotta get up. You know, all joking sense, so. aside, Ralph. You know, you're right, Cody. Ralph knows, man. Rocky movies, man, have saved my my ass. Literally, man, they've they kept me going. Same. There's times I didn't, no shit, didn't want to keep going, and I just think about those movies, you know. And there's always such humanity in those movies. They're yeah. awesome. Yep. And with that, um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to A Lot's Happened Since Yesterday. We have been recording for about the last five minutes, so um, thanks for the impressions oh, and shit. the uh, discussions about yeah. Rocky and all that stuff. Uh, sure. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest today is the one and only oh. Mr. C. Santini. Ralph, you weren't ready for that, were you? <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just like still tripping out about you saying that we've been... I've, I've been trying to mess with my hair for the last five minutes, and you're like... Oh, we've been recording for the last five minutes, dude. I, I like I said, Damn it. I'll edit the shit we don't want out. But you guys are doing too good a shit for not to me uh, for for me not to hit the yeah. record button. Well, it's it's gold. So. It's gold. Well, it's gold. It's gold because we got you on, Steve. No, no. Here, thanks, Ralph. Man. I'll make it. I'll make it easier. I'll make it better for you. Here, Steve, get on it. Let's do this. What? What's that? What are we all doing? We all fixed our hair. We're all looking good now. Oh yeah. Now I we're got, even, I got dude. That's right. There you go. No, but I got to say, I'm really happy today because I've got one of my best friends in yeah, the whole world, in the whole entire planet, this whole world. There's billions of people on this world. And this is one of my brothers, one of my best friends. Um, uh, I, I trust this man. pretty good, too. I trust this man with my life, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Um, Believe it or not, Steve, he is know. talking about you. <laughs> yeah, no, I trust this man with my life, and I'm going to be honest and real right now. Um, Steve has been one of the best friends anybody could ask for for uh, many, many years. How long have we known each other, Steve? Oh, my God, what, 1914? It's, it's, uh, it's, it, it's been about... It's been a while. It's been about 15, 15 years. years. 15 I, I years, yeah. 15 years. And this man has just proven to me to be such a true gentleman, uh, a gentleman and a scholar, as they say. And uh, oh my god, you're yeah, being too no, kind. But... No, absolutely, you are a gentleman and a scholar, and 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 you you are very talented. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, bro. Uh, l let the audience know because um, I think more people need to know about Steve Santini. I agree. Before Steve Santini. I'm sorry, Ralph. Sure. I didn't mean to cut you off with the zoom. It no, it right. really the the lag fucks up. So I didn't mean to step on you what you were saying. No, no, um, no. It's all good. No, what I was going to say though is um now I forgot. Damn it. No. Um I will say this. <laughs> Steve, you you have such a history that we're gonna go deep with you. So okay. I, I've already decided like we're gonna call this episode episode two, but it's gonna be the Santini saga part one. Cause you've wow, cool. dude, you've been all over the place, you know, and so yeah, we're. I want you to give, like Ralph said, we do want you to break down what you do, but we are going to like start from the beginning and really get into the the the, the long and veiny of it, if you will. Because oh great, you know the way I met Ralph. Well, I mean I, the way I met Ralph was uh, I perform as an extreme escape artist, and uh, you know I started doing escape artist stunts and, and, and shows and that when I was 14 years old. I did a book report on Houdini, and for years I was breaking out of jails and hanging from cranes getting out of straight jackets and all that and then you know that was i was doing the houdini shtick i was doing it the way houdini did it you know where i'd get all cuffed up on stage go behind a curtain well that's bullshit and for years because houdini was an idol of mine i guess i 
I think every escape artist or magician that wants to do this stuff, they follow Houdini and they go, all right, if I do it like Harry did it, you know, I'm going to have some of that fame or who knows. So I'm doing stuff Houdini did, like the water can, the milk can escape and the straitjacket and the, you know, the trunks and all that. And uh, really, it was okay. It was okay. And I, I was very good at it, I guess, or I, I was working at it. But honestly, it just wasn't catching a live audience the way it should. I mean, people see those stunts, but if you're going to go, you know, behind a curtain or something, I mean you're playing in the old vaudeville way and that that scene is dead like that's totally dead and i mean i love metal music and i've always loved hard music and alice cooper has been one of my idols and you know i, I noticed look at cooper he's on stage and he's making a whole spectacle about what he's doing and he's got guillotines and he's got you know a hangman's noose and uh, you know uh, michael myers is trying to kill him. all this stuff he puts on stage yeah and i thought you know what Let's strip away all the magic, all the bullshit from escapes. Let's just make it, people can watch me trying to beat the Reaper, doing in, intense, insane shit. And if I have to pick a lock, I'm going to show them, look, I'm going to try and use this piece of wire. I'm going to try and do this thing. And incorporating into that was music, heavy, heavy music and music that spoke to what I was doing. And that's how I, you know, that's how I found Ralph. I mean, I, I found his his band Serpent Underground, and uh, we started talking, and he really liked what I was doing. And I was actually reaching out to him for permission to use uh, some music that you guys had recorded. And I was, you know, and graciously, I was given permission to do that. So, Steve, I, took, Steve, I, let, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, brother, um, but I, I got to ask you a question because you mentioned yeah. something. Um, smoke and mirrors. You. You're an expert, uh, Steve. So from your expert um, position, um, what do you think? Was Houdini all real escapes or was he a little bit yeah. of smoke and mirrors? Well, there was, he was a magician. Like uh, I wanted escapes, my escapes to be extreme sport, like extreme okay. stunting, extreme like parkour or whatever, you know, where you, you're seeing it. And what you see is what's really happening. Now, a lot of the stuff Harry did was extremely dangerous. I'm not going to put him down at all. But he wanted to preserve some mystery to it. I mean, he was in the vaudevillian era where, you know, there was great illusionists, and huge stage shows and stuff. So he wanted people to walk away scratching their head. But some of the stuff he did, he did it the way I was doing it. Like he'd get chained up, jump off a bridge into a river where there's thousands of people watching this. There's no trick there. There's no going behind a curtain, you know, and he hung from cranes getting out of straight jackets and all these cool things. So I would say that guy definitely uh, was the grandfather of all this, all these things. Um, and he was a great inspiration. So he did a combination of both things. I think given his, given what he wanted to do, he'd prefer it to be more of a mystery but he went out there and he did stuff in full view as well. Well, let me ask you this, because you, it, when I was reading in the long, because we've known each other for a long time, so I've I've known yeah. your history, <clears throat> and it in that sense, when I read the parts where you getting into the the escape artistry and the and the lock picking and you know where you said you did the um uh why can't I think of the word the apprenticeships at the um yeah. at, at the locksmithing, he you know uh, yeah. that parallels a lot of what Houdini did back in his day. So I want to ask you, cause I thought this when I read about Houdini back when I was a kid, how do you get into the mindset of this is what I want to do? Like I want to be able to pick these locks and fuck it, throw me in a lake and I'll show you, I can do it. Like at what point does your brain go fun, fun, fun. Now nah, let's freak some people out. I mean, I left home at 15. I, I was adopted. My adoptive family, real train wreck there. It's a mess. And, uh, so I left because I had a dream. I had somebody I wanted to be and uh, I had things I wanted to do. So I went and apprenticed for a locksmith. I worked for 10 bucks a day. I slept on his concrete floor in a sleeping bag in the basement for a couple of years. The guy was a, a prick, very difficult guy to work for. And he'd often get drunk. He had an apartment behind the shop. He'd get drunk and stoned and pass out. So I'd come up and start playing with the customer's locks, you know, and if I, if I, if I fixed something he hadn't taught me how to do, he'd smack me in the head when nobody was around for making him look bad. Fuck. Once he knew I knew how to fix locks, if I wasn't repairing locks, I'd get the smack the same. So like I, I would I started learning the locksmithing stuff because I felt that I needed it to do what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. 
And, I, you know, to answer your question of how, how all that went together with the extreme angles of things, I, I just I just wanted to do things that people could, could sink their teeth into and really feel. Because, you know, as a musician or as a magician or an illusionist or an escape artist, I didn't want magic to be part of escapes. I wanted to throw that in the trash. Right. Um, because the two just don't go together. Uh, they shouldn't go together. And especially now in our cynical world, man, if you, you got all chained up and said, I'm going to duck in this room here and I'll be out in five minutes. I mean, people yeah. are like, fuck you. You know, you're obviously got some gimmick or whatever. Yeah. So it, it, it came about through watching the evolution of audiences where I started to, to, to take these things and do them in a different way because people just, they won't put up with it, you know? So, and I guess to that sense, like Ralph was saying, um, that, I guess, is where the smoke and mirrors of entertainment would come in. It's less because, like you said, it, it, on one end, if you just go, hey, look, I've got a, you know, I've got a pair of handcuffs I can get out of. Watch me break them real fast. Right. That's cool. But if you're doing it to what you said, you know, hang me upside down by my ankles and now there's some real meat to bite into and there's the entertainment aspect, you know. Well, and, also, I, you know, also to go with that at a very young age, I was going around to cop shops mm -hmm. and I was walking in this you know this kid this teenager going hey i'll show you a trick you know you guys are bored today put your cuffs on me i'll get out of them and that led to jail cells and then all of a sudden i had media coming out to cover those things so now you're not just breaking out of your own shit because this is what a lot of escape guys do they're breaking out of their own stuff right no now you're going and hey man this guy just got out of a cell this guy just broke out of a, an ancient dungeon or a fort or whatever and i started to get press for all that stuff and that you know that builds up your your scrapbook your portfolio back then it was all printed press and it just it was step by step towards the inevitable of let's do this stuff as hardcore as possible and really you know um music plays a big part in what i'm doing now and or what i did with the extreme stuff it's it's like taking people on a journey and you know alice cooper as i said earlier and then another band i love is rammstein from germany hell yeah with the fire and the effects i mean it just seemed to be like so many escape guys that go on stage, right? And right. They, they insult their audience's attention by going, this is a set of regulation police handcuffs, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, fuck whatever. Bullshit. You know what? My idea was put yourself in a situation where you don't even have to explain it to the audience. They can see you chained to something. Drills are coming down a conveyor belt at your eyes, man motorized drills and they see it getting closer and closer and closer and closer they're with you now they're with you in that situation they're there every step of the way and suddenly they start to feel it you don't have to tell them that's idiotic when guys go oh, look i got a, i got a water can here it's solid look at the lid you know yeah whatever why are you going to cover it with a curtain then if the thing's real don't insult my intelligence yeah. take me on the journey right and that, because if you're right, if they step off camera, it ceases to be an escape art and becomes an illusion. You know, a magician. Exactly. That, and then you're right, because that's why we have like, you'll hear magicians. What do you do? Oh, I'm a sleight of hand artist. Oh, okay. Right. So we know you've picked the lane of I can get right up in your face and, and, and like deceive you. But you're the lane of no, this ain't tricks. This is just pure skill and talent and balls, you know. Let's let's it go to town. That way. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, part of that was, uh, you know, I did the escape stuff for many, many years and I wasn't I was getting a lot of media. I was getting gigs, tons and tons of media. Um, but I wasn't. Uh, how do I describe this? I wasn't I wasn't at that point yet to take it full view to do it the way I needed to do it. And right. So I took a break from it and I went 15 years. I performed as a stage hypnotist. I did hypnosis. I did mentalism. And that gave me the ultimate insight into how people think about things, how they perceive, how, the depth of perception. How, and, and, you know, to study hypnosis, I wasn't reading books on that necessarily. I was reading books on the great dictators of history, the people that were great orators, public speakers. No. How did they possibly reach people? How do you get inside someone's head with just words? And then I combined that sort of skill and went back to escapes and went, never mind just words. Let's create a situation that people can see that they can immediately identify with. Something that scares the shit out of them. Like, you know, like I said, drills coming at their eyes. Everyone's afraid of 
don't hurt my eyes. You know, some people are afraid of the dentist. Don't touch my teeth. Right. So you start tapping into that psychology of what scares the living shit out of people. And you turn it into a performance art where you're taking them right along with you. And then if you do it right, they feel that it's them strapped to that machine. Right. Okay. So I got, I got to ask you this, Steve, and I don't want you to get mad at me. Uh-oh. This is, this is where we roll up the sleeves. <laughs> Jesus. I got to ask you this, brother. No, because me and you have talked about this kind of stuff. So, um, okay. So we're talking about smoke and mirrors versus yep. reality, like yep. true reality. Like you're doing this for real. There's, there's oh, nothing, yeah. there's no bull BS about this. Okay. Can we, this is like, can, can we set, make sure we're clear though? Because Sometimes I use yeah. smoke and mirrors for just as like a way of saying well, performance well, practice. You know, like we do a lot of smoke and mirrors legitimately yeah. to make effort to make cool. But you're saying like the illusion of these aren't real well, handcuffs. And so well, I'm going to go around and fake it where Steve is like, no, well, these motherfuckers are real. Illusion is, is a great term for right. that because right. that's exactly what it is. It's an illusion right. of, you know, they have it planned, pre-planned. There's very, very little room for error because they have practiced this over and over and over and over again. It's like a juggler. You know what I mean? He gets it. He does it until he gets it down, you know, down packed. So he's got it. He's, he's good to go. So th that's what a, an illusion to me is. Right. Uh, a guy that has practiced this trick to make you, you know, to make right. you believe that he actually did it. He actually, you know, whatever it was, I don't know if he, you know. There's an art form in that too. I mean. Yeah, of, of course. Yes. And yeah, they're all performance practices. Yeah. But you, you were an extreme escape artist. You weren't using illusions. You were doing it for real. So no. what's the difference? Right. You tell, tell me what's the difference and tell me whether or not you think people prefer one to the other and why. You know, if you go to see, say, David Copperfield, I guess I can best put it this way, right? David Copperfield is an illusionist. Uh, Siegfried and Roy were illusionists. Doug Henning was an illusionist. And, you know, you expect there's a magical angle to it. Like, you know, if one of those guys did an escape, odds are, you know, they get in a tank of water or something. I know Doug Henning did this on one of his TV shows. Um, he was putting Houdini's water torture upside down, Okay. And he's, you know, your, your ankles are clamped to the top and you're underwater and they pull a curtain in front. Henning made it an illusion. So in other words, a, a guy, while the curtain was covering the water tank, um, a fireman came out wearing a hood and holding an ax to smash the glass in case he's not out and save his life. After four minutes, the audience is going rangy. They drop the curtain. The tank is empty. You can see right through the glass. And the fireman takes off the hood and it's Doug Henning. Okay. <laughs> that is illusion right. incorporated into an escape. Like, in other words, you know, it's not quite, it's, it's still dangerous. I mean, when you're getting, you're actually getting lowered into a tank of water, but the moment that curtain goes in front, other things are happening. Right. You know what I mean? Because it's so less the about difference. the tank of water and more about the, 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 well, from my knowledge, from the metamorphosis illusion, it's yeah. it's it's the it's that rather than the it's less the water and more of the hey look at me I'm over here now kind of illusion. Yeah, it's it, it's it's kind of a fun thing. It's kind of a fun bit. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. It, it's a fun sure bit because he's he's yeah. in the tank now. All of a sudden he turned around. He's the fire guy. You know what I mean. So it's <laughs> that's very cool. Like that stuff takes an incredible amount of talent. Right. An yeah. Incredible amount of planning. I mean, I I'm not looking down on guys like that because those guys are cool. Yeah. But really. Um, I didn't want to go that direction. Like my, my direction basically is, or was, because I don't really do a lot of this stuff anymore due to injuries. Um, but my basic direction was, you know, it's like watching a Saw movie in person. There's a guy chained up. To that's not fucked just, up, dude. And, and that's the other thing we <laughs> wanted to take out of it. When I came up with this extreme aspect, I didn't want to be doing the escapes everybody else did. Yeah. I didn't want to, you know, be in a tank of water, none of that shit. I wanted to get chained up to the back of a muscle car and have this bitch take off down the beach at like you know 80 clicks in 60 seconds if i'm not out it'll rip your head right off 
And there's people that have stolen that idea and tried to go and do copies of it. And a couple of them have gotten really badly hurt. Um, and I probably could have as well. But I mean, I, I wanted stuff that people could be there with you, you know? I look at you like this, bro. Uh, Steve, Steve Santini, my brother. Um, I look at you like this. You're like one of those unsung heroes. You're like, remember the stuntmen back in the day? Yep. Um, uh, Dar Robinson. Dar Robinson, yeah. Yeah. Robinson, yeah. yeah. And all, the, all those and, guys um, did all kinds of cr crazy stunts and they never really got famous or, you know what I mean? In a big way, nobody ever really cared about them. They, they, they liked the actor. They thought the actor was doing yeah. it. But it was yeah. them. It was those stuntmen that were performing those crazy stunts. And that reminds me of you because you, you did the real deal for like years, you know, years. and you hurt, you hurt yourself. Oh, and, shit, yeah. <laughs> oh my God. You, 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 you broke so many parts of your body and you're so beat up over it. And uh, you, <laughs> how, how long can you go? You know what I mean? Before yeah, you're no. like, okay, I can't do this anymore. It's uh, incredible because you were the you were the real deal. You were the evil Knievel of uh, Escape. Uh, so speaking of Knievel, that's yeah. Sorry, go ahead. go ahead. Speaking of Knievel, sorry, there's a time delay, but you know, speaking of Knievel, I, I was joking with Vera the other day, and I was really sore. Like I got stenosis in the neck. I got all kinds of damage going on, and I said to Vera the other day, I said, "Now I know why evil Knievel." felt so bad at near the end of his life. I mean, the guy was like, he was in chronic pain. I mean, mind you, he smashed everything. Yeah. I haven't smashed everything, but I've done enough damage to feel, you know, to feel the pain of it on a daily basis. And, uh, you know, looking back, I, I've had people ask me, would you do it? Knowing what you know now, hurting as much as you are now, you know, you chronic pain, would you do it? And my answer is, fuck yeah because it was something that was unbelievable. You, you do something like that. I, don't, I can't speak for Knievel because I never met the man. I don't know what he felt after a jump. You do something like that, like some of the things that I did. And afterwards, I'd go through a period where for half an hour, I couldn't remember if the audience applauded. I wouldn't remember a thing that was done. And I'd have to ask people that worked with me on the crew, hey, did people like that? Did it, did it go okay? But then it would come back to me in pieces over the next couple hours. And you know what? It's an incredible feeling. Like when you get into a situation like that where a muscle car is going to rip your freaking head off, you might be having, I don't know, marital problems, money problems, whatever. Suddenly, you got 60 seconds. And none of that shit can be in your head. Nothing. You hear that, thing, that car revving. And I know you've seen the footage on YouTube of that thing that I did. You hear that, and then you hear the injector kick in, and you know that car's about to go. You know what? When it's over, it's like a feeling of rebirth. It's unbelievable. Like when the memory starts to come back and you realize, Jesus, I did that freaking thing, man. I survived it. Oh, there's nothing like it. Nothing like it. Yeah. Oh, my gosh, it's, dude. Like, do you just talking about it gets me like, kind of freaked out about it <laughs> like yeah it, it, it's a real high it's a real high it's an adrenaline high for sure i know I i'm not an adrenaline junkie i'm not an adrenaline junkie i hate adrenaline i'm mm -hmm. not a guy like honest it's, this is going to sound insane to you it, it sounds crazy to everyone i tell i don't like heights but i've hung hundreds of feet upside down from cranes i'm terrified of heights i did it because i guess it was expected of me or whatever there's certain things that you know, I haven't really enjoyed. Um, but when you get over it, like you said, it's, it's it's an amazing feeling. But I don't like adrenaline. I've never been, you know how some guys do parkour and they do all sorts of, you know, stuff, their bikes and stuff. It's insane. Um, and they say they, they're adrenaline junkies. They do it for that. I never liked the feeling of adrenaline. With me in those situations when, you know, 60 seconds or something's going to happen, for me, it's always been a methodical Step A, B, C, D. It's like a chess game with the Reaper in my head. Right. And if the Reaper suddenly puts the bishop, and things can go wrong, even if you plan it, even if you think you're you're physical enough or your mindset, something mechanical can go wrong. Something. I mean, I've had stuff happen. Then you just have to think for the next move. How am I going to block that bishop that's moving to take my knight or right. whatever? It, it's 
it's a split second thinking. And I really, if adrenaline if, in my, anytime I've felt adrenaline in my life, I hate the feeling of it. That sounds weird. eh? In a way, but I think, I think in a way though, it does kind of make sense because adrenaline junkies are like, I'm going to stand on a cliff and just jump off and hope for the best. And you know, <laughs> you are in a way kind of putting yourself more at a calculated risk. You know, your skill puts you at the ability to escape or not escape. And you know that your skill will get you out. You're not going shit. I hope this fucking lock works this time. It's like, no, I know I have my skill. So you're instead of being an adrenaline straight up, I just want to inject that shit straight in my veins. You're more. No, I know if I do it right, I'm fine. So you have a little bit more pre-calculation to you. You know, it's funny, but there's still errors that can happen. I had, a, oh, we had an old family. I had this old Scottish doctor for a family doctor, and he's passed away now. But uh, he thought what I did was absolutely insane. And I mean, I think it is, when too. I started, <laughs> well, when I started having my neck problems with a lot of neck pain and, and my hands weren't working properly because it was affecting the nerves, I was in there one day talking to this old Scottish doctor, and he said to me, he says, listen to me, lad. One day, you're going to need your hands. You're going to reach up to undo a lock or do something to get yourself out of harm's way. Your hands aren't going to work. You're going to drop the lock pick. And then where will you be? And I said to him, I said, Dad. And he looked at me and he says, don't get smart with me, lad. He just he totally gave me shit. And he said, you look, your neck is breaking down and it's causing a lot of nerve damage, you know, down your arms and stuff. You know, it's, it's, you just get to those points, you know, the deck is slightly stacked in your favor where you have abilities and talent, but honestly, um, things can fuck up. Right. So as I said, Steve, I'm going to start asking you the hard questions now. So I gotta, I gotta, I gotta find out first of all, how did you get started doing the extreme escapes i mean what what was what was the thing that drove you to start getting involved in that kind of field uh i, I guess you would consider it uh entertainment the field of entertainment. you mean after after you mean after the initial houdini type escape things what made me change no over? no what i meant i mean what got you involved in the in the beginning to begin with what what oh, what's a good one what was it that hooked you into wanting to do a stream escape? Yeah, what drove you to that? Like, made you, what burned Maybe you to go you, that way? You you have to admit that is not the average goal no. of a person for, like, a career. You know what I mean? I, I think you could easily say it was extreme mental illness. But, <laughs> uh, you know. No, no, kidding. Oh, kidding aside. I was a kid. I was in school. I was, uh, what was I, 13, 14 and I had to, we had to do a book report and hand it into the teacher. And it had to be a biography on somebody famous or some, somebody. And uh, I hadn't done it. I, it. The idea was boring to me, so I just didn't feel like doing it. And then the day we were all supposed to hand in the written report, and then we were supposed to get up and do an oral report, stand there and talk to the class about what we wrote. About a week later, I hadn't done the written thing. And the teacher says, look, you haven't handed it in yet. I'm assigning you a book. She reached on her desk, had a little bookshelf, handed me a book. She said, I think you'll find this guy's life to be pretty interesting. Well, it was a book on Houdini, of course. Holy shit. I went home. Yeah, I went home and I read this book and I just, I just couldn't believe that anybody could be doing this kind of stuff. It just, it, it, it made me, it gave me a lot of uh, things to look forward to. Cause when I was a kid, I was really small and I got thumped out a lot in school, punched out constantly. And then my birth name, I mean, my adoptive family's name that raised me, my last name was Adams, not Santini. So, you know, I had all these kids at the school, you know, the Adams family started when Mrs. Adams started, <laughs> you know, you get tormented by the these fuck? kids, you know, all the time. So in reading about this, this immigrant guy that came to America with basically nothing, his father was a rabbi and, you know, they, they had a really tough life. He escaped from poverty. He also built his body up in the process of doing all these things, you know, and I, I just found the concept of escape uh, a really great one, something that really captivated me because I thought, you know what, if I can be like this guy, maybe nobody's going to bug me anymore. Maybe nobody's going to pick on me anymore. So 
there's no books on how to do this, or at least I didn't know where to find them. This was just a biography. So I start messing around. I got kids in the neighborhood. They're locking me up in their bike chains, you know. The parents are getting calls. Look, your kid's over here. He's wrapped in my kid's bike lock. He's going to jump into the deep end of our pool. <laughs> and I started doing for real. I was doing this. <clears throat> and that's, so it was a book report when I was a little kid that got me into it. That's insane, dude. Do you remember, just out, just out of curiosity, do you remember the name of that teacher? Uh, yes, Mrs. Welsh. Shout out to Mrs. Welsh. Holy shit. Yeah. Little did she know. She a, yeah, she was pretty cool. Um, she wasn't so cool, though, when a, a couple months later I showed up in class with a set of handcuffs uh, that I got from trading a kid a throwing knife I had. And <laughs> I guess he got the throwing knife taken away at recess, and they took my cuffs away, too. So I, I don't know. There's no sense of humor these people. Yeah, that's not fair. No. You ain't, there ain't nothing wrong with that. You had a fair trade just because he got stupid with his trade. How's that your fault? I don't know. I think some teacher took those cuffs home and used them for, you know, after hours purposes. Okay, so <laughs> Jesus Christ, man. <laughs> what they did with it. Um, so I when know, you're. That's what started the whole thing. Was that book, that, that Houdini biography? That's crazy. The, um, the title of the book? No, no, I, you said that's what started it was the Houdini biography. That's what started it. Right. That's, yeah. that's so crazy. But I was in the perfect position. Yeah, I was in the perfect position, though, because I needed something, you know? I was just, as I said, this short kid getting picked on a lot, being a loner, you know, and a, all these sorts of things. And in that book, that book didn't teach me methods, but that book about that guy's life actually helped me escape. It after a while, I, I, you know, I started caring more about learning that craft and teaching myself that craft than I did about what anybody said to me at school. You know, it, it, it helped me. It, it, it actually built me up. It was cool. So have you ever had, I got to ask you, have you ever had uh, an escape that, uh, you know, you, you were worried about to begin with, I guess, I get, I, I, I mean, you know, now I'm throwing a lot too much, a little bit too much into it. Yeah, but, but uh, you know, because I know, because you think about what you're going to do before you do it as a professional. That's 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 how we are. You know, that's one thing that we have share in common. When we're, yep. pl we're planning an event, we tend to go and, and, and run it through our heads several times and go, okay, what are we going to, you know, how exactly how are we going to perform this? Right. You know, right. and so um, as a professional, I imagine there's been some escapes that maybe you were a little bit concerned about. Um, was there anyone that really scared you that made you think, "May maybe I shouldn't do this"? You know, I had I had two really bad accidents in my career, very bad accidents, and one, both of them could have killed me. Um, I was doing an upside down straight jacket when I was 21 years old at a festival. And uh, I had forgotten to, the assistant that worked with me had forgotten to package the things that go around my ankles so I could hang from this crane and be relatively safe upside down a hundred feet up. So we'd driven from the town we were staying in over to this other town to, to do this escape for this festival. And uh, we forgot the leg restraints that were gonna attach me to the crane. So there's this huge crowd there. It was done for Canada Day, which is a huge holiday here. It's like your Independence Day or whatever, or Fourth of July. So we went to a tack store, which is a store that sells horse, you know, gear uh, for riding horses, saddles and bridles and all this stuff. And we got a couple of these leather straps that looked like pretty robust things. Anyway, we got a piece of chain from the hardware store. We linked it through both straps. And, uh, you know, we're going to use this to hang me upside. I figured, you know, look, if a horse can wear this stuff and there were like horse hobbles that you use on the feet of the horse, you know, when you're grooming it to keep it from kicking or running, I figure, well, if a horse man can't break this, everything's going to be cool. All I've got to say is the day that we did this escape, this upside down straight jacket escape, my assistant, I don't know why he did this. He'd never done it before. He put the one hobble buckled in onto one ankle. I was laying on the ground. He put the chain through the, the hook of the, the crane with the big ball on the end. And he looped the chain around twice in this hook and then went to the other leg and did that one up. I don't know why he did that. You know, uh, if he hadn't done that, though, we wouldn't be having this discussion. They're taking me upside down. I'm supposed to go to 100 feet. At 60 feet, 
I literally hear pow. It sounded like a gunshot. And what it was, I didn't know. Well, I knew in a second. A piece of rivet falls right by my cheek, just boom, but the other way. I was upside down. So it went, boom, hit me in the face. My one leg goes, whoa, way out to one side. The chain rattles through the hook. Thunk. And because he looped it around two or three times, that other anklet that broke, one of the rivets popped on it when I was 60 feet up in the air. And if he hadn't, if he just put the chain through the hook, that would have gone straight through the hook and I would have fallen and killed myself. Um, Holy fuck. How high were you when it popped? I was at 60 feet. Jesus, dude. On my way up to 100 feet. And I'm screaming, uh, stop the crane, stop the crane. But I was stuck up there, so I got out of the straitjacket, and nobody in the audience had a clue what had happened. I got out of there. They got me down to the ground. I was white as a ghost, I guess. You know, he told me, holy shit, you, you look really freaked out. And <laughs> some newspaper people were there trying to, you know, trying to talk to me, you know, what's wrong? You know, you, you, and I'm just like, got to go. And we just went to a bar and we had several drinks. Oh, my God. He knew exactly. <laughs> he knew what had happened. I knew what had happened. Oh, no, man. No. That's a tough situation right there. Good yeah. Lord, dude. What are you going to do, right? <laughs> well, you, well, you can't do anything, and I'll tell you, it, it was unbelievable. It was terrifying. I, I, like, you have a split second where you're like, oh, fuck. You know, and you know, you just know. I'm sure that, I'm sure a lot of people have had those moments, you know. Uh, yeah, but not hanging that. upside down by a chain you know usually it's like oh shit someone almost crashed into me with their car or you know oh i almost ran over that dog you're just like ah oh, shit <laughs> i almost made it 200 feet <laughs> well then you have that moment of realizing after it's all said and done you have these weird moments or at least i did of sitting there for a couple of weeks afterwards wondering oh, okay why was why did that happen well something broke and it was beyond our control what broke and then the other part of that reflection is is this trying to tell me something, you know, am I supposed to not do this stuff anymore? I mean, is there a lesson here? And then the other third thing is you really get outside yourself and you start to think there's a reason I didn't die. Well, why didn't I die? Right. You know, it all sounds very, I'm sure people in plane crashes and that they go through all that stuff, but you go through those stages. And, um, but that, then I had another one where I was underwater for five minutes and I, I physically drowned. I was dead and uh that was just through sheer stupidity and carelessness on uh my part and my assistant's part we were doing the houdini milk can i had a replica of this thing built and uh can you do a quick just a quick breakdown right of what the rep of what the milk can is and yeah it's uh well it's like a 45 gallon steel drum but his day, they used to deliver milk, like the bottom of it's angled upwards and it's got shoulders on it and a neck. And uh, on this neck are hasps that are attached for padlocks and staples. So the, the lid's got these hinged uh, locking things on. So when you get chained up, the thing's full of water, you get put inside, they push the lid on, they lock the lid on with six padlocks. And you know, I, I'd done this escape for years. So you were basically okay. in a big, you were basically in a big um, metal jar, basically, right? Kind of, yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like a big metal jar, like back in the day, they used to bring milk in those those big yeah. bottles, right? Oh, it's, shit. It's similar to that, right? We have it, yeah. um, we're doing this in post. I will put a picture right there. Bing! There'll be okay. a picture of the milk jug right where I'm pointing. Right, yeah, because it looks like a big metal yeah, Houdini's, yeah. milk jug, right? Yeah. Yeah, it does, and, but the lid locks onto the neck, you know, and uh, this is the, okay, here's the, the big mistake we made. This thing, I did it for years. The can was made out of galvanized iron. The staples and the locking mechanisms that were attached to this were made out of steel. Now, I didn't have a place to store the can for a couple of years, so I left it at my buddy's place in his backyard. Oh, shit. Well, the metal components that locked this thing had rusted. Had rusted. We just went ahead and did it like we'd always been doing it. You know, oh, we're going to do the can again. Okay, they want you to do the milk can grand finale. Okay, well, let's, let's haul it out. 
We never tested it, tested it. And you know, on something like this, this, this water tank, milk can, whatever you want to call it, there is a gimmick that gets you out of the can. It doesn't fit with my other extreme escapes where it's full of you and you know, there's, there's nothing to it. This thing, you cover it with a curtain so you don't want the audience to see, number one, that you get out, number two, how you get out. Well, it had sat in the backyard for two years and rusted. The gimmick that released the lid had rusted solid. So you couldn't get no out. Idea. There was no way to get out. No way to get out. Fuck. When it was at a, it was in Midland, Ontario, and it was at a Shriners convention. And uh, it was a dinner the Shriners had put on. And I got into the thing. It was full of water. We had a curtain put in front of it after I'm locked into it. And we had John Carpenter's Halloween music just blasting because I used to, I used to like to use that because that tune scares the shit out of people. And it's like time ticking. Eh? It's like, yep. Pop, 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 pop. And everyone in the audience sits there and they freak out. Curtain doesn't move. They can't see whether you're out or not. Well, within 30 seconds of being under that in the can, I had to wait till I could hear the music come through the walls of it. Then I knew I could get out because then you knew the curtains in front. 30 seconds after being in that can, the music started. I reach up for this thing and it won't move. It won't move. Um, so like, I can't tell you what that felt like. I, I, sorry, I get a little emotional talking about this because you then know you're fucked. Yeah. I, I've never had a situation in my life where like the, the hanging upside down where the ankle strap broke, that's one thing. But I, you know, that happened very, very quickly. This is worse. This is, I knew I wasn't getting out. And I knew that goddamn song was going to play for almost five minutes. And I knew that no one was going to come and check behind the curtain. Because they were certain you just climbed that's... out. Yeah, well, the idea was you get out, you hang out behind the curtain, the music's playing, everyone gets freaked out, then the music stops. And then your assistant's walking around with an axe or whatever, a crowbar, acting all concerned. And the crowd starts yelling, open the can, get them out. You know, and you build it, and then you suddenly stumble through the curtains like you just made it and you barely survive. Right. So I knew, I knew based on how we performed it that I was screwed. I mean, I knew that first 30 seconds, that, that gimmick's not undoing. It's not coming loose. The lid's not coming off. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I've got to try and hold my breath. And uh, so I did. And then, um, then I knew I wasn't going to be able to make it. And um, all I remember really, thankfully, are all these flash bulbs going off in front of my eyes. And uh, I woke up in an ambulance on the way to the uh, Midland General Hospital. Yeah. So, so I was under water for five minutes. Fuck. Um, it turns out that the Ontario <clears throat> Provincial Police, uh, they, had a, they had a sergeant, the Ontario Provincial Police, that was one of the head shriners that was sitting on the committee for the dinner that I was performing at. Apparently when my, I was told this, when my, my assistant pulled back the curtains and I wasn't there, he started crying. He just freaked, oh, he just dropped. God. He just didn't know what to do. And then he, there was a ring of keys we had. This thing had six padlocks on the cover, on the lid, locking the lid, but we didn't use padlocks that were key to like. So this cop runs up on the stage and he grabs the key ring of keys out of this guy's hands. Who's just sobbing. He's freaking out. And this poor kid, I mean, I, I feel so bad about it. And the cop grabbed the keys and I guess he's trying to open every lock and they won't because they're not all key to like, right? So he's jumbling and jiggling and wasting time. So he ran off stage from what I was told. He got a fire extinguisher and he just bam, bam on the underside of the lid. Um, and he knocked the gimmick loose and he knocked the lid and the collar off and everything and pulled me out and started doing a CPR and got my heart going again. But apparently I had no vital signs. Wow. Mother fucker, was... dude. Yeah, that was, uh, you know, that's, that's what happens. You, uh, you just, uh, you become complacent. You just say, Hey, this is something we've always done. It's going to work. It always worked before. And then you die. And then the guys. How do you how do you go back to to doing doing the escapes? Yeah, how is that not your last escape? 
I did it one year later. I, I, I actually did the milk can escape one year later using that same can. And then I put it away and didn't bother with it again. I, I knew if I didn't do it again, mm. I would never do anything again. And so I you just, just wanted, yeah. You just wanted to beat it. Yep. But it's ironic. It wasn't a thing yeah, to beat. I know how you know? that is. Sometimes you. Yeah, it's ironic. It wasn't even something to beat. It was something that we worked with for two years and never had a problem with it. But then again, I never left it outside. You know, the, the components didn't rust and just things you never think of that are so subtle. And, you, you know, I, that was it. Um, you know, I, I can argue in honesty that some of the things I did after that were way worse than that. Way more dangerous things with fire, explosives, you know that that kind of stuff. And uh, but you know, pretty much with water, that was it for me. I just didn't do much with water after that. So that's where it drew the line. You were like, okay, I'll do everything else, but yeah, I, I don't know. I, I just and the other thing was, I moved away from that whole uh, look. I'm behind a curtain. I'm in a thing. I'm going to get out of it. You guys are going to applaud and think I'm cool. Right. I moved totally away from that because I realized that. You know, I, I, I didn't see the reason to ever have to do that again because I, I had an accident. I went and did it again and I beat it, but I didn't see where that fit into the modern world or anything I wanted to do. You know, I wanted to at that point, it gave me a lot of time. Like I took about a year, reflected on it. And then I basically said, look, if I go back at this ever, I don't want to do what Houdini did. I don't want to present my stuff the way he did, because really it's like an Elvis tribute artist. You know, you're paying tribute. But the audience never truly appreciates you for being you. Yeah. You're not you. Yeah. You're you're a shadow of somebody that has a bigger shadow than you'll ever have. And you know, if you keep going down that path, you'll never you'll never find an identity. And I didn't want that. Fucking A, dude. You you you've done a, a lot of stuff, Steve. I mean well, I, I mean a lot of people don't know this about you, but um, and we're gonna try to change that. Uh, get our audience to know you a little bit. Uh, you've done so much stuff in the entertainment industry um, between extreme escapes, um, hypnosis, because uh, you did hypnosis for a while, didn't you? Yeah, for like 15 years. I was one of the top uh, hypnotists, stage hypnotists in, in Canada. We did wow. coast to coast, colleges, universities, theaters. Uh, yeah, I was... Got really good at that. And then, um, but that's interesting. That's what made me go back to escapes. I did hypnosis for so many years. And then I was working in Winnipeg, uh, Manitoba and living out there. And there was a young guy that an agency asked me to take under my wing to come along to open for me. And he was a magician, an illusionist guy. Well, within one year, he'd stolen my show. He'd stolen, he'd, he'd recorded my shows without me knowing, and he'd ripped off the method I used to hypnotize the people, the skits that I would, I would put them through, the whole thing. And then I, you know, I remember saying to Vera, what the hell am I going to do now? I just lost, I just lost a 15 year livelihood and all the skill I put into it. This guy, you know, just ripped me off. And magicians are terrible for that. I'm going to tell you straight up. They're the biggest thieves on the planet because most of them don't work. So if they see a guy that's working, instead of going, well, you know, it's nice, I'll find my own way. What do they do? Bullshit. They go and they steal the guy's stuff, be it a close-up routine, be it mentalism, be it escape, solution. Anybody that's doing something that works, there'll be, there'll be a lineup of magicians to steal it. So when the hypnotism thing, when I watched 15 years of work kind of disintegrate because somebody ripped off my act, started undercutting my, my price, I thought, okay, fuckers okay, I'm going to come up with something. You'll all be too fucking scared to steal. Go ahead, steal this shit. And I went back to escapes, made it heavier than ever, started building death machines like the drills and the spikes and the, you know, explosive stuff and working with fire. And you know what? Nobody stole it. Fuck yeah, dude. <laughs> Fuck yeah. See, now the thing is, is, when Ralph and I started thinking about doing this podcast, we said we wanted to um, some of the themes we wanted to talk about was how does us as musicians and our art and our creativity, you know, transfer and, and, and correlate to or not correlate. How do they um, how does your path and our path cross? I mean, we're so different yeah. and I'm not talking about, you know, how did we meet? We know how we met, you know, 
we we already covered sure. that. But what I'm saying is is one of the things I'm trying to do here on top of it is we have all collectively we have collectively decades of knowledge in the industry in our own way. And oh, yeah, I, yeah. I and I wanna kind of bring ideas along that can show people, look, it doesn't matter what you're doing in entertainment, you don't give up. You don't quit. You find no. your route and you keep going. And that is what you just said is it's fucking brilliant because you literally had your livelihood just taken from you. And rather than going, well, yep. I guess I'm going to go and fucking, you know, sit in a cubicle the rest of my life. You're like, no, fuck this. Uh, let's figure out another way. And now they're like, no, nah, fuck that. I don't want to touch that. You know? Well, that's exactly what I did. And I wanted to be sure that the way, the way forward, and believe it or not, there was all kinds of magician forums. You know, when I came up with this character, the dark master of escape, this is what, you know, I called myself because literally, you know, it was wonderful because I had everybody in Matt, all these other escape artists, so, so pissy and bitchy going, oh, he's too old for that. He's too fat. Look at him in the fucking leathers. What, do you, what the fuck do you think he's a biker? But you know what? They weren't doing nothing. They were copying Houdini. They were swimming in my wake, too afraid to steal my shtick. There you go. And you know what? This is what you have to do. I think probably all of us know of, of celebrities, you know, real you know, big name celebrities that have had to reinvent themselves or change their angle, change with the time. And, you know, if you're not capable of doing that, especially in the world we're in right now, where, you know, Andy Warhol said we'd all have 15 minutes of fame. I think if Andy Warhol were alive today and said that, he'd have, he'd have to say we all have 0.5 seconds of fame. Yeah. <laughs> because everything changes so quick and people have no attention span. And, you know, it's that whole thing. So I, I think anybody in any business of entertainment has to be able to adapt because if you don't, you're going to lose it. That's true. But it's, it's not about the fame for you, is it? Steve. It's not for me. For yeah, it's no, not. No, no, for me. I, 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 the only reason that I, I, I say it, it's, it's, it's a question, but it's, it's more like a statement at the same time because I know you for so long. I know that it's not about the thing for you, um, but I'm, I'm going to ask you so, so, so that the fans can listen and know, get to know you a little bit more. Sure, sure. It, it's not about the thing for you, is it? What's, it, what's, what's it about for you? For me, doing these extreme escapes became a puzzle. Um, I, I love, I love, I love trying to get inside people's heads. I love trying to reach people, which is the same with musicians, the same thing you do, you know? You want your music to touch people. You want your music to, to reach inside, grab them, and give a twist. And I want the same thing, you know? It was never about the fame. And for me, it was about how could I push a, an art form if you want to call escapology or escapes an art form, what direction could I push it in to have it touch people, to have it have a stronger effect than it ever had forever? And it wasn't about fame. You're right. It wasn't about that. But it was about molding that art form into something that people could relate to, that they could watch and they could feel it right alongside with me while I'm doing it, which is very similar to, you know, when I've watched you perform, uh, Ralph, when you're on stage singing, you know, uh, this is the same thing. We want to touch people. We want to reach out, you know, and be it through music, be it through watching some guy come within one second of, of something really bad happening to him. <laughs> this is what we need to do. And uh, it's never been about fame. I couldn't give a shit, really. It got to me, to me, it became like a, like, like a painter, like a Van Gogh, like a Picasso. I'm not saying I was that good in my art. But you know what? I'll bet you those guys painted as much for themselves as they, you know, a lot of those guys never planned on becoming famous. They just wanted to make art. And that's what I wanted. Always. Yeah. Well, a lot of people don't know this about you because, um, you know, it's a big, it's a big world. Um, oh, and, yeah. uh, people yeah. get lost in a bunch of nonsense. Uh, uh, nowadays, people are more interested in fail videos than anything else. But they are. Uh, and it, it is what it is. But true talent like yours uh, comes along very rare uh, in this life. Uh, and uh, you, you've done so much. You, you, you. Thank you. Let, let's talk about you for a second. You, so 
I, I don't know where you started, but I know that you, you're an extreme escape artist, you're a historian, you're a collector uh, of, uh, you know, how would you, how would you phrase that? Well, look, when I, when I started, uh, I don't know how you'd phrase it. I mean, I'm, I'm collecting rare pieces of history. Quite a few of those rare pieces of history I'm drawn to seem to have a darker side. Um, history such as, you know, the witch hunts, the inquisitor, the criminal history of criminal punishment. How that came to be was for me escaping out of jails and, you know, dealing with all sorts of historic restraints. I eventually got to the point where I started collecting this stuff. I got fascinated with the history behind the things I was using as tools in my performances. You know, how do you know about these things? Well, you dig back into the centuries and you learn, you know, how badly we've treated each other, you know, over the millennia, as it were. Um, that's that's kind of what led to collecting that kind of stuff, the, the history of criminal punishment stuff. And we've got, you know, a house full of it. This is an Iron Maiden well, yeah, downstairs, that, a guillotine that, in the front window. That's Please. exactly where I, I, I was going with this is because people, people, are, people do not understand. You have a museum, basically, in your house with, yeah. uh, with, with all these uh, collections from, uh, you know, most of them are from medieval times, correct? Uh, the period just after that, yeah. And then there's also Viking artifacts here. There's stuff from like the most. The most you have Titanic. Stuff. You oh, have yeah, Titan Titanic's, yeah, been a big thrust of my life. You know, wow. I, I, I uh, work with museums around the world and auction houses authenticating Titanic objects for uh, collectors and high end purchasers at auctions. Um, and we have, uh, when I say we, I mean my wife Vera and I, we've got many of our Titanic objects on display at two huge Titanic museums in America, in Branson, uh, Missouri, and Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. And uh, so, you know, this is the kind of stuff that I always had a passion about from being a kid. And then you get older, and because of entertainment, I would get to tour a lot. When I tour a lot, during the day, you're not doing gigs, you're not doing the show, so you hit up antique markets, and, you know, you're going here, you're going there, and it gave me a chance to hunt and dig stuff up that I just started to collect, you know? And for instance, when I collected Titanic, I lived in Halifax for nine years and that's where they brought the bodies of the floating passengers. They managed to recover uh, frozen dead floating corpses for burial Jesus. in Halifax. And I started looking around for people that had Titanic relics, you know, and back then nobody gave a shit about the boat. And I ran ads in the paper, you know, knowing that people had gone from Halifax to recover these bodies. And I started to find objects and people would sell them to me. And I started accumulating this, you know, this collection. It's, it's kind of weird, you know, one, one path has always led me to another, which has led me to another, which has led me to another. And uh, it's been pretty cool, great adventure. Do you think there's a tie? Uh, do you think there's a tie in with all these uh, different, uh, you know, I mean, cause if you think about it, their interests that you have, you've done the, yeah. uh, you've, you've done the extreme escapes, you know, obviously, um, uh, you were motivated by several people in the industry that were doing escapes, uh, namely Houdini. Um, but you know, you 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 went forward in that, and you took it to a very far degree. Um, right. Uh, what Ripley? Is, I I believe it's Ripley's Believe It or Not uh, declared yeah. you as the most extreme escape artist in the world. Right? Is that the not world's correct? most extreme? Yeah, the world's most extreme escape artist. I got a full two I mean, pages. That is in a book they put up. Yeah, it's undeniable. You you are undeniable at this point. Ripley's Believe It or Not is no joke. So no. for people out there who don't know, but they're basically uh, who would you compare them to? They're 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 huge. They, they're they, kind of like a Guinness World Record, you know. But they're, they're, uh, they're exactly so they're kind of like a Guinness Book of World Records. So you are basically the Guinness Ripley's Believe It or Not World Record holder of being the most extreme escape artist in the world. That's a big deal. Um, how does that make you feel, honestly? When I got a call from uh, Ripley's, and I don't even know how they, they found out about me because, you know, uh, I don't know how they did it, but uh, I just done this escape from a flaming vault being blasted with flamethrowers 
in Toronto's Nathan Phillips Square, which is where Toronto's main city hall is on New Year's. And there was like 35,000 people in front of me, a live audience. And it got broadcast live to over 2.5 million people that night. It was New Year's Eve. And I guess Ripley's found wow. out about it. And they, they actually, I got an email one day and it was, I thought it was a joke. You know, the Ripley's guy, you know, we've heard about you and blah, blah, blah. And we knew about this and we've looked up your videos and we want to, we want to feature you in this new international book called Expect the Unexpected. We're going to cover you on two full pages and we're going to give you the title, The World's Most Extreme Escape Artist. Because Holy they shit. said, we've looked around. We can't find anyone doing stuff that's at, the, at that time that was that crazy. And uh, <laughs> man, I couldn't believe it. I mean, you know, it's weird because I grew up, I grew up, you know, my going down to the States and going to Ripley's museums and stuff. And I had the little, the paperback books Ripley's put out. And I knew about Robert Ripley, the founder. And so for me, it was like this little kid inside me going, all right, you know, and, something I'd read about my whole life and something, an institution that I was interested in are calling me. And I was like, that's cool. Oh yeah. It's absolutely it cool. great. I remember they, they had a TV show. What, uh, what was that actor's name? He was like Dean a, Kane. He was Superman. Well, yeah, but Dean even, Kane. even before Dean Kane, they had another actor that was in the uh, spaghetti Westerns. Oh, uh, uh, what was his name? Uh, the guy that was, uh, Lee Van Cleef. Clint Eastwood. Clint Eastwood. Lee uh, Van Cleef. In, in the movie with him, I think. It was. <laughs> so it, was, yeah. it wasn't... Who did you originally say it was, Steve? It was not so-and-so. It was Jack Palance. It was not, well, uh, it was not Lee Van Cleef. It was not Lee, Lee Van, Van Cleef. Cleef. That, it was Jack that's Palance. Who I, that's who I thought it was. I'm, I'm the one here. It wasn't it's on Steve. Yeah. Oh, I oh. thought it was Lee Van Cleef. But it turns out to be uh, Jack Palance. You know, he had that little like lisp. It was like... S -s -s -s. I don't know. Anyways. <laughs> yeah, he's one of those reptilian guys. Dude, yeah. Jack Palance, his, my favorite two roles was obviously Curly in City Slickers. But also, he was the, what was it? He was um, Jack Nicholson in Batman when he was the Joker. Before he turned into the Joker, he was the head mob guy. Right. Yeah, and he's like, you are my number one. Oh, that's Remember right. that guy? Yes, and then he right. fucking, yeah, what does he do? He like lights him on fire right. or some shit like that. So so the reason we're bringing Jack Palance up. That guy would be really scary to go on a date with. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to what? eat? <laughs> now you're going to take your clothes off. And then I'm going to put my hand in yours, in your blouse. And he has all that. Yeah, Jack Collins, man, screw it. Yeah, no, he yeah, was that's good, right. <laughs> he, was, he was, he was, he was good, dude. He, he was smooth with the ladies. They liked him. He was, but he was. Uh, um, <laughs> Jack Collins. But the reason we're even bringing Jack Collins <laughs> up is because you know you 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 did uh, you did um, you did Ripley's Believe It or Not. They they had you as the most extreme escape artist in the entire world. That was planet. cool. That was a hell of an yeah. honor. Um, and um, and and Jack Palance was the guy that did the TV show for that. So I, it would have been cool to have seen you on the show. Um, yeah, I know. Unfortunately, that that award was awarded to you later on, right? Is that correct? Yeah, I was. It was. I got to be in a book they distributed internationally. This huge coffee table hardcover book and two page spread, which is almost unheard of. And it was cool. You know, they were very nice to me and. Uh, they, they, that meant a lot to me because it was, for me, it was like the little kid, you know, got to become some part of something, part of a machine that he admired when he was, when he was a kid, you know? Well, and, uh, we're going to talk about this a little bit more, but you, you, you've done so much television work. I'd like to do this on the next segment that we do. With yeah, we will. Because sure this will. is good. It's going to take up a lot of time, but Stan Lee. Yeah. Mar Stan the Lee. Marvel creator, Stan Lee. He also, had you as a guest on his show. What was it called? Superhumans? Is that right? Stanley's Superhumans. Yeah. Yeah. Stan. That was. Yeah. That was. Did, that must have been an honor. Did man. you meet the man? Oh my god. No, I never got to meet Stan. Oh. I gotta say, I never met Stan. I'm gonna be straight up. I mean, I could sit here and lie. Oh yeah, Stan and I we hung. No, I never got to meet <laughs> Stan. And Stan was just the, you know, the host of that thing where they basically licensed them. But they had a host that traveled around and met the people that did the performing. That's who I hung with. But I mean, 
Stanley had to approve what was on that show, and it was pretty cool because, you know, he said some pretty cool things about me. So, you know, hey, Stan. Well, and regardless of meeting, he gave you the stamp, man. He gave you the Stan stamp of yep. approval, dude. Oh, yeah. He gave you the stamp of being a superhuman. That's, that's fucking that's cool, cool, dude. I got to give you the metal horns. For Absolutely. That. <laughs> right on. That was cool, dude. I mean, come on. How do you not look at that and go, wow? Yep, I did something. You know, that's that's badass. It really is. It's pretty that's, cool. It is. It really is. I mean, a lot of people don't understand it. Um, they just look in and go, "Oh yeah, well, whatever." You know. But yeah, no. Honestly, he's... come on. You know what I mean? That's the dude that created Spider Man and and all those other cool. you know, super awesome. Uh, I mean, the, the list goes on for days. But once again, for me, Stanley did, and you were on his show. Yeah. Once again, for me, though, that's another one of those childhood dreams. You know, it's like, you know, I grew up reading books about Robert Ripley and went to the Ripley's museums. And then all of a sudden I'm in Ripley's books and they've given me this title. I grew up, you know, everybody, Stanley comic books, you know, and I read all that stuff. And then to suddenly get, you know, a production company contacts you and they go, hey, we want you to be on Stanley Superhumans. I was like, this is great. <laughs> yeah. No, no, yeah. Great. No, absolutely. You, 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 you've done some pretty well, amazing stuff. You, stuff. you literally got pissed off and said, you know what? I'm going to become a superhuman. You know, you want to, you want to take my right? shtick? I'm going to, I'm going to throw a fucking saw at my head. Try it, buddy. Much. You know, I mean, a lot of people don't <laughs> understand the industry and how it works. And, uh, they don't understand no. uh, people that have defied, uh, you know what I mean? They've defied everything that comes along with it, and they, they've continued to go on. They've done stuff. You've been on uh, several shows on, on television uh, from Europe to America, and you've had your own two TV shows that were produced and yeah. uh, aired on television. And we'll get into that. It, it, it's amazing what people yep. don't understand about this business. Um, and you've got a lot of light to share. Oh, no, you've got so many, you've got, so, you've got your hand in so many pots in the entertainment industry as a whole that your perspective is phenomenal. I mean, cause some person might go, Oh, well it doesn't work that way. And you just pop up and go, ah, no. I beg to differ, sir. It's, you know, you know, it's, it's not always though, as we get into that, when we do the TV segment, I'll tell you right now, there's going to be stuff I want to say about the industry. That's not very flattering to the industry up until now. My story has been one of, uh, you know, conquering the obstacles and going, you know, doing the Rocky Balboa, you know, like get back in the ring, take a couple hooks, you know. Uh, that was my story up until, you know, that. But when we start talking about television, man, I got, I want to talk about it, you know, dirt track talk about it because that industry, you know, a lot of it's, it's destroying itself based upon the content they're producing or not producing. It's going to be great to talk about, you know, pitching, uh, concept to TV and to executives and network executives. So we'll get there too. Yeah, I'd love to hear that shit, dude. That's a, it's a super amazing, interesting uh, stuff. That, and it's so there's so much, uh, I've learned so much from you over the years. I've gotten so much knowledge about the business, uh, the entertainment industry through you. And, uh, you know, I Thank appreciate you, that. I appreciate that so much, brother. Yeah, no, dude, you, you, you know, you brought me in. You helped me out. Oh no, no, you know, no, we're we're, be... on, we're on two different. We were on two different sides of the, uh, you know, uh, the pendulum, if you will. I I don't know, but we, we, you know what I mean. We, you were swinging this way, I was swinging that way. But <laughs> the, the the point is, is we came together in the middle and we did some cool yeah. shit, like we those two metal really balls. Cool. <laughs> we did some really cool stuff. I want yeah. to get into oh. that. I, I yep. know, right? Oh, yeah. No, no, but Steve is a, a, a is a natural. I've known this for years. I mean, from the first time that I started talking to Steve, I think it was 2005, 2006. It's been a It was it was actually uh right around the time I joined Serpent cuz I yeah, remember right. the day you came to me with the email and we were like, "Okay, Dark Master of Escape, I already love it because we just yeah. you you signed <laughs> yeah. it that." And we were like, like, fuck yeah, dude. Guy out. He wants to use our music and look what he's doing. It's like, this is really cool. So, uh, you know, and then uh, once we started working together uh, yep. on the TV show, uh, we became like really close friends. And yep. uh, 
and, and that changed everything. But, uh, you know, I, I, that's why I want to do this in bits and pieces. I don't want to just do it in all one segment. I what I love about what we're, yeah, what I love about what we're doing right now is, um, you know, you get, a, I, I, I've done talk shows in the past is not a podcast, it's my first actually, but in the past, it seems everybody asks you the same questions, you know, and you never get a chance to dig down deep. You never get a chance to talk about, you know, the time that you weren't having a good time or the time that, you know, the production sucked or something went wrong. They, they all want the story, same stories. Oh, wow, you did this and that. And you, you sit there with a grin on your face and you're, you're telling the stories. But, you know, me personally, I feel I'm, authenticity always mattered more to me than anything else. Right. Like in anything I did, be it collecting, be it performing, be it my friendships, be it my everything I like from music, everything. It has to be real. And one thing I'm having the biggest problem with nowadays is the bullshit, the, 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 the lack of authenticity. We got all these hipsters running around going, authenticity, it's authentic. I'm real. I'm authentic. Bullshit. You're like everybody else. And you're running around with beards. You're wearing the same clothes. You got the suspenders. You know, you, you're just like, you're not unique. And it seems we live in a time when unique doesn't exist anymore. And it's not given the credit it should be given. You know, this tribe mentality of like, <clears throat> I'm going to be like everybody else. And henceforth, I'll fit in because I'm so brilliantly disconnected. I mean, if anything, the internet and all this stuff, all the tech that we have, it's created legions of tens of thousands of lonely people that, that, so in order to connect, since they're not good conversationalists, since they don't have interesting lives, since they don't have passions like we did, that we chase down, we grab them by the throat and we wrestle them to the ground and we savored eating and sucking the marrow out of those bones. <laughs> they don't have any of that stuff. They don't have any of that stuff. Yeah. So to, to be something, they're just part of what everybody else is doing. It really, it, it's unbelievable. Like you can even see it in the shows on TV where they're doing renos in houses. Yeah. Everybody, everything's in gray and black. And, you know, we're going to have this kind of flooring. Fuck, man. What a shitty world. <laughs> well, the, the, I think one thing we, we might should consider too is everybody is so concerned with being like one of a kind, we broke the mold, you know, everything like that. And there is an aspect to that in everybody, but we're all the same kind of being. So in our uniqueness comes the fact that we're not unique. Is, yeah, I, I don't see a lot of really uniqueness anymore. Do you like, you got to admit there's not, I mean, there, and the people that are unique, they don't seem to be getting appreciated the way that they should be get appreciated because <clears throat> All of a sudden, they're unique, so they don't fit into the level that you know other people might perceive to be acceptable. Um, well, but but like, what I guess what I mean by unique is is like how unique can one get? You know, what I mean, I can well, sit back and saying we're doing a podcast, we're unique, and I'm like, well, but how how many people are doing podcasts right now? Now we have a view. Our view on the podcast, however, is unique because my world true. getting to here. Versus somebody else's versus a Rogan's are going to be two right. polar, three polar opposite directions, but they're going to get right. to the same de destination. And so in our uniqueness, we're doing the same shit. I mean, where I am pulling left and right from the people I look up to from the Joe Rogan's from the Busos, from the Santini's, you all have you right. all have paid my way in your own right. And without it, I am not who I am, but I ain't unique. At the same day, because if I pick up a guitar, somebody can play the song I wrote. They're all the same yeah, fucking no, notes. But, no, no. But it's that whole thing. You wrote it. You went out and did it. Yeah, you know exactly. I, mean? like I, 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 I see that the world has changed from the people that shake the tree to the people that just want to sit under the tree and feel the shade. You know what I mean? Like, I, yeah, I, I'm not I'm not seeing enough of that. And you mean we mean we, we need more tree shakers is what you're saying. Damn right. We do. Gotcha. We need more people that are willing to uh, you know maybe not uh, get locked in a milk can full of water but uh people that are willing to take their passion like their own passion and really go out there and give it you know balls to the walls get out there and and, and you know win lose or draw you're still doing it because you want to do it not because 
you want to be like them over there or them over there. You're just doing it because you love it. I, I, I want to see more of that so passion. What, in your opinion, what is it that you think holds people back from doing that? I mean, honestly, let's uh, let's uh, let's talk. The world's, about yeah. Well, the world's changed. I mean, um, well, I has it because because people have been scared and faint out of fear for yeah. many centuries, Steve. I mean, they have. You, they have. You, you are. You are. You, you are. You are a historian. You are a collector of medieval uh, instruments that we use uh, to torture people into confessions. Um, and and we'll get into that later in a big way. So yep. for right now, I'm just going to touch on it and say yep. that you are an expert in that field. You understand that fear was a big part of that. Fear is, is huge. that not correct? Is that a false statement? Hey, man, I'm going to yeah. tell you guys okay. something. No, okay. so, so fear is a big part of that. Um, but, and I, I trust me, I know almost, in my opinion, I know almost everything there is to know about fear. Um, and I say that from personal experience. Uh, I know what fear can do. Um, I know how it can cripple people, how it can hold people back. It might surprise both of you to know there was a time in my life where I suffered from serious chronic depression and I didn't leave the house for five years. Check that out. So I just, something, something just went snap and I couldn't go out and, and do that. And one of my biggest fears was, believe it or not, being around people. I used to stand on stages in front of thousands of people, but there was a point in my life where for one reason or several reasons ganging up on me, that I just shut all that down and I had the hardest time breaking free from that. I think fear is something that everybody faces. I don't know though, if they're facing the fear of being ridiculed, uh, if they're facing the, the fear of the unknown. Um, but you know what, you've got to admit between the time when I was doing the stuff that I did, I mean, honest, check this out. I used to walk into a nightclub. There was one club I used to play a lot. The guy that ran it, his name is John Wheeler. I went in there one time and I said, he says, what do you got tonight? And I said, I got this electric chair, but it explodes. And he's like, what? <laughs> I said, yeah, on the, on the seat where I sit, we put a grill in there. We got five pounds of smokeless pistol powder in this thing. I got one minutes to get out of all the restraints, dive off the chair, and then it's going to shoot flames 10 feet into, this, into the air. And he goes, okay, now this guy's club had eight foot ceilings. <laughs> he, he was like, he was like, this is going to be fun. So I'm up there with my buddy. We're putting tin foil on the ceiling directly above this chair. And you know what? This is the difference I'm talking about. Back in the day, he knew that that would draw people into his club. He knew that it was something no one had ever seen before. And he was willing to take the chance right along with me that I knew what we were doing. We weren't going to burn his fucking club down. And we didn't burn his club down. And the thing became a huge hit. Nowadays, everybody seems to live in a climate of fear. Everybody's suing each other over just being offended. Like, what the hell? Offended. I was escaping exploding electric chairs. I was, it just, it just blows my mind. We live in a time where litigation rules the world. Lawyers, you know, they'll sue everybody's ass for the slightest thing. People are afraid to open their mouth. I mean, fear. Yeah, let's talk about fear. But the fear that's holding people back isn't maybe their personal fear. It's the fear that everything hoists upon them. Like, we just live in very uncertain times, man. We live in very radicalized times where people are doing some of the most messed up <clears throat> shit, unbalanced governments. Like, I just can't believe it. No wonder people live in fear. The media is telling you, you know, like, <laughs> the evening stories are all about Oh, this gang did this and they're burning down this neighborhood and these guys over here are doing this, you know, and lock your doors and oh, it's too late. No, you got the virus and it goes on and on. People are permeated with fear now. They wear fear like a sick cloak that they wrap around themselves and that fear justifies the worst actions they could per perpetrate as humans. Now, the fear that I experienced when I was doing what I did and that kind of fear are two different fears. It's my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of fear. Sorry to go that. off on it like that. But no, no, dude, no, you're no, absolutely right, though. You're absolutely right. There's a lot to think about there. There's a lot of fear going on out there. And uh, fear-mongering is like a huge thing right now. 
and uh, oh yeah, yeah. I I kind of in a weird way. I know it's kind of odd for me to say this, but uh, it scares me that people yeah. are so afraid. You know what I mean? Sure. It, 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 does that make sense? It scares me that oh, yeah. people were so paranoid and so afraid. Well, he. You know, I was just going to say my, my thing with it is, is, you know, you hear all of the questions, you know, they give you the cliches, you know, they say, you know, we fear the unknown. We, you know, sure. that that's what you got to do. And, you know, and then you hear the other side of the positivity stuff. You know, if you can't handle the fear, then do it scared and all that. What if anything for me, what it does is it just raises questions like if we're supposed to be brought up to conquer our fears, if we're supposed right. to be the people who look at our fears, internalize them and go, these are either real or not real, yeah. or are they perceived or something that I'm putting on myself? And we are smart enough yeah. beings to determine such. But the question I have is we know that fear is a very powerful controlling factor for us. So the question it should be beckoning is why the fuck is it being crammed down our goddamn throat so much? Because and if it's it works. exactly because I'm like, everybody says, if you believe you can achieve, if you visualize it can happen, follow your dreams and it'll happen. And yet you're telling us our dreams simple. should be too scared. Don't take chances. Don't right. question. Don't find out who you are. Shut True. the fuck up and sit in the corner. Yeah. As well, though, you've also got the other people, like suppose you're a fearless person, you want to do something that, that shakes the trees or is outside the norm. And I don't mean being hooked up to a muscle car and chains or whatever, whatever it is for you, right? Yeah. But then you go out there with that attitude. And, and my, when I was younger, I just decided this is what I want to do. And I'm going to do whatever I can do to get there, right? Come hell or high water. But I think nowadays, if you have an individual like that, who truly is willing to take some serious risks and do whatever they got to do, despite the fear that's that's surrounding them on all sides, they might run into people that don't dream like they dream. They might run into people that, and I, I know it's like this now in the entertainment industry in a lot of places, like you go and try and do something different. They want you to do what's safe. They want you to do what's conventional, you know? And I don't just mean stunts, or it, it could apply to any part of life. So many other people are walking around out there afraid and paranoid that if you're one of the people that doesn't feel that way and you come forward with unique things, ideas, perceptions, presentations, immediately they're afraid of you. You know, so the people that will help you, like in my day, I wanted to do that exploding electric chair. So I said, John Wheeler, can I do this in your club? He's like, great, it'll bring the people in, you know. Try and do that now. Try and do anything now. You know, we got we got entertainers that paint kids' faces. They make fucking balloon animals. And they have to run police checks on them. And they have to make sure that they're, you know, oh, my God, is that paint you're going to put on my kid's face? Is it going to make them break out? Oh, my God. You know, it's fuck for fuck's sakes. Stop being afraid and start living. So what? You know, it's not the end of the world. But that's where we live right now. Uh, there's, like a, there's a lot of paranoia. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. I, I I I will leave you. We'll we'll leave you on a quick note because um, we're going to do another couple of uh, okay. episodes with you. But um, great. Thanks. Since we're talking about that, just real quick, I I'm curious as to what you think about. Um, any association with what's going on in today's reality um, versus, you know, current events uh, versus uh, what was, because I know you're not, you, you are a spiritual man and you have your beliefs, but you're not, uh, you're not a religious man. You don't necessarily, um, is it fair to say that you, you don't believe in the God of the Bible? Is that fair to say? I believe the Bible was written by men and I believe the Bible was heavily edited by men. And I don't believe that 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 is an ancient book uh, cobbled together from a 50 million places and then edited by 50, you know, by, by, by a council of people that wanted it to tell a specific story. That's what okay. I believe. So, yeah. so in all fairness to that, 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 that thought, 
uh, that frame of thinking. Um, would you, do you see anything that actually, because this is interesting to me, um, whether you believe in it or not, and whether I believe in it or not, um, I do find certain things that were mentioned in the Bible, so to speak, um, you know, like revelations and Psalms and stuff like that, different uh, uh, prophecies that, and I'm not trying to get on too much of a tangent here. But no, that's cool. I, I, I'm, ju I'm just curious, do you see any um, com comparance to what's going on to today? It, it was uh, spoken about here in Revelation. You know, yeah, you, this it was mentioned that this kind of thing would be going on at this time. You know, do you there, see any comparisons? There's comparisons if you want them to be. If you want there to be comparisons, you're going to have them. For instance, like we got to remember, the people that wrote the Bible were primitive people. They were writing it at a time when they were exposed to only what they were exposed. They didn't know what tech was going to be, what the future was going to bring. But they were they were reporting on things they'd seen in their world, either real, imagined, either mythical, who knows? But I can tell you one thing. Um, when you get to things like revelations, you got people talking about plagues and pestilences and things like that. You know what? Those things have been going on since the dawn of man, since the dawn of humanity. There's nothing about end times in any of them. We've had world wars. We've had plagues. We've had all this shit. And you know what? Really, from the, from the point of view of a primitive author writing the chapter or contributing to the chapter on Revelations, and you want to get a message across of, hey, man, you better smarten up or the end times are coming. Are you going to hit people with, you know what, it's okay. You can sin and come on back to me later. Papa loves you. Or are you going to hit them with, hey, there's going to be plagues and locusts and shit and, you know, lava and all, all this shit going on? No, because if you hit them with the kindness and the gentleness of which is supposed to be what Jesus preached, that's not going to have any effect on them. Even back then, they knew fear-mongering. Mm -hmm. Besides, Nostradamus, same thing. You got predictions that are relatively vague, but people make it fit with what they want to believe. They go, hey, Nostradamus said there was going to be a plague. Holy shit, look at the locusts. Or it's hailing outside, or whatever. I don't know, man. Humans love patterns. And we're always looking for those patterns in things because it helps us feel we have some modicum of control over things we can't control. Just my opinion. So COVID-19, not, not, not the end, not Armageddon. Yeah. It's a big problem. It's a big problem. It's real. <laughs> I, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not an anti-masker, man. I believe that this is something that if we don't get a handle on it, a lot of people are going to, you know, lots of people are going to die. And a lot of people are dying now. Um, I, I don't see it as a biblical thing, though. No, no bloody way. Because if you want to do that, you, you, you could say the Spanish flu that came along, you know, in the early 1900s, you could say, hey, you know what? That's revelations happening. Like, if you look at any of those events, any of the wars, the pestilence, the famines that have happened, all as a result of human action, most of them. If you look at any of them, they all fit revelations, don't they? So why is now the end times when, hey, 100 years ago, it could have been the end times? Because last time wasn't, bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's true. And I'm not trying to mock anybody's religion, but no. I'm talking what, what I'm the reason I take this position is because I worked with hypnosis for years. I worked with the power of suggestion for years. And I learned a lot about how people perceive events that happen around them and how they can make those things very real when those things don't have any tangible substance to them at all. And especially when you're talking about faith. Man, oh man, you know, you, you, faith can be the strongest motivator in anybody's life. And if faith happens to be religion, well, you can make anything fit, can't you? He well, yeah, you know, I, I, it's funny that you mentioned faith because I remember this one specific dude, you know, he was... Just, just kind of a rough, you know, boxer. You know what I mean? He was just kind of, he was one of those guys that just had like a lot of soul. You know what I mean? He didn't have no quit in him. And he, he was he a rich man? Was get a, no, he wasn't a rich man. He was he was a very poor guy. Yeah. And, uh, he came from Philly. Yeah, I know and, who you're uh, talking he, about. He, but he had faith that he wanted his, to get his locker back. 
You know, he had faith that he could, he had faith that he could get his locker back. You know, locker. Mick, I don't know. Like, <laughs> you, you, you took away my locker and now you got me cleaning out spit buckets, you know, and this, this ain't good. You know, all I want is my locker, Mick, and, and I, I'm going to get in the ring. And they, they're going to hit me three times on this side, you know, somebody left some bigging for a right, you know, but I'm going to come You know why you don't got your locker back? Why? You know I why, kid? Because you're a bum. I you're know, a bum. Bobby. Yeah, I know, <laughs> Bobby. Yeah, you don't know. I'm going to get another gym, you know, where I got my own locker, you know. All right. Fuck you, Mick. Do they have towels there? You bum. Do they have towels? <laughs> Dude, listen. They got me, more than towels. They got me, room. Me and Steve are good friends. <laughs> Me and Steve have been friends for a long time. But when we finally got together in person, oh. he started doing the rock impersonation. <laughs> and it was so hilarious. Everybody in the car was cracking up. <laughs> so I just wanted to introduce you to, yeah, right. uh, to Steve's Rocky Balboa impersonation. Sylvester so Stallone will be proud. You want to take us out with one, Steve? Yeah, you know take what? Us out I, with one. I look one of those to ones. Next you... time we can get together, you know, I gotta go because, like, I ain't got no Adrian no more. She passed away, but you know, Vera, she's German, and if I don't do what she says, you know, she's gonna like, hey, right, hook me right, you know, and I, I'm not gonna feel so good. So you know what? Hey, yo, Ralph. Hey, Cody. Yo. Hey, yo. We'll see you next time on the flip side. You know, absolutely. Steve Santini, you are the man, All my right, friend. Brother. Guys are great. Thank you, <laughs> Steve Santini. We will have him back again very soon. We're gonna we're probably gonna be doing three episodes with him. So check it out when you get a chance. This is a lot's happened since yesterday. Thank you so much, Steve Santini. Uh, Thank you, you guys. Are, Love you guys. You are a gentleman and a scholar. <laughs> and uh, if you haven't gotten a chance to check out Steve yet, go to what is it, Santini Central? Yeah, www.santinicentralonework.com. Yeah. yeah, check Steve out. You can go on YouTube. You can uh, just type in his name, Steve Santini, uh, a stream escape artist, actor, yeah. whatever you put in there. Um, uh, uh, there, He's got, he's, what, what's the show that you have that you did for a little while? Uh, your own YouTube show? What's it called again, Steve? Oh, Relics from the Dark Side. Yeah, the one that we did Relics, for YouTube. Yeah, Relics, Relics from the Dark, from the dark side. side. Make sure you check out Relics from the Dark Side with Steve Santini. It's a really cool show. He's got over a half a million views on that channel. Um, it's really, really cool, interesting stuff. Uh, check it out. Subscribe. Uh, I have a funny feeling that Steve will be um, adding more episodes in the future. But even if he doesn't, there's like a lot of really cool episodes on there that you've got to check out. So check out our buddy Steve. He's an amazing uh, entertainer. Oh, man, He's done thanks. so much in the industry. We're, we're, no, we're going we're gonna to continue this on because there's so thanks, many guys. stories and so much stuff to go. Yeah, this is just the beginning. You mean I might, anyway, I might get my locker, you know. I'm going to get my locker back. You're going to get your locker back, bro. I'm going to get a locker. All right. <laughs> All right. I'm going to get my locker back. That's really great, you know. That you, you guys are both really, really good souls, you know. I'm absolutely honored to be your friend. You know, you guys are, uh, yo, yo. And Thanks, with man. that, we gentlemen. Oh, shit. I'm going to say he doesn't know. How about we do this? <laughs> you, guys, you guys cut out for a second. I got you guys. Grab your drinks. Get your drinks handy. All right. Are you ready? Uh-huh. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, what? Dude. We had to, we had to drink. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, we can. Um. Yeah, see, you done fucked me all off now. I was, I had it, and now it's oh, gone, man, dude. Here we go. Great. All right, ladies and gentlemen. With that, Steve will be back. Um, I'm not exactly sure who we have scheduled slated for episode three, but Steve will be back at least two more times, probably more, because we're gonna do a deep dive on this crazy bastard. With that, <laughs> my brothers, raise your glasses. Salute to all y'all. I love you guys, Score. Steve. Skull. Cheers. Steve, thank you so Skull. much for being a You're guest. Great. You are the man, brother. You guys are great. Thanks a lot, and I look forward to getting together again. Hell yeah. We will catch you next time.
All Thank right, you, Steve. The man, the myth, my brother, Steve Santini. We'll see you guys next on the next episode of A Lot's Happened Since Yesterday.